This is fun. I, this is the first time I've been able to talk to anybody in a live audience for about two years now. So this is great. Um, so, got it. So, so what I thought I would do is tell you a little bit about some of the work in our lab and give you just a quick overview of the things that we like to study and then dive into some more particular things on immune response that I think you might find interesting. We certainly find them interesting. And then I'll turn it over to Ahmed to tell you some of our latest data. And uh, first off, of course, the important land acknowledgement. I want to acknowledge that we are on the unceded territory of the Squamish, uh, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And certainly all the work I'm presenting you today would not have happened if I hadn't settled here. So either directly or indirectly, we owe some debt to those folks. And how do we advance here? Go. Sweet. So, so this is my lab. Um, you can see it's a very diverse group, which I'm particularly proud of. Uh, the work I'm going to tell you about today, largely the newest stuff is coming from Ahmed, which he'll tell you about personally. But it's also been built on a couple of graduate students in my lab, Melina Messing, who works on asthma type 2 immune response and also COVID. Uh, Sam Shin, who's done some really nice molecular characterization of innate lymphoid cells that we'll tell you about if I get a sec. Um, Kevin Leslie, who does a lot of the bioinformatics in the lab, a great colleague, and then some old work from Bernard Lowe and Matt Gold, who are graduate students in my lab and are now off on future directions. Um, all of the work I'm going to tell you about today has been collaborative with Fumio Takei's group at the BC Cancer Agency, and he's really the uh, Canadian expert on innate lymphoid cells and kind of the founding father of the field, at least in this country. And then some work from uh, Fabio Rossi and Mike Underhill, who are helping us look at using chymal stem cells. So uh, just a little bit about me and about the lab. Uh, I trained as a actually a chemical engineer many, many years ago, which is living proof that you can come back from really bad early career decision and do fine. Um, and no groans, yeah. Uh, th then what many would have considered another really bad career move, I went to Birmingham, Alabama for grad school to work with a guy named uh, Max Cooper. And I'll say that that was probably one of the best decisions I ever made. So worked with a really great international and collaborative group and learned how to collaborate and, and deal with collaborations very effectively, team effort to try to solve hard problems. And that was foundational for me. And you'll see that in my group as well. Um, and then I went to EMBL in Heidelberg, uh, which I think is another really good career decision. Not all good science is done in North America. And I think the more often you travel in your career, the better you, you'll be. That again was a very international and very collaborative place and really put technology as the focus on how you can do good science. And I think that's something we need to consider very carefully at UBC. So that's my preaching point. Uh, finally, I started back here at UBC. That was my first independent faculty career, um, CBR and a variety of other centers. Most recently, School for Biomedical Engineering. So I'm trying to save a few other engineers from a fate of uh, petroleum engineering and back into some science. Um, foundational for our lab is hematopoietic developments and immunology. And you folks should all be very interested in that because I would argue that those cells are driving forces or protective forces in every single disease you will encounter. So unless you get hit by a bus, hematopoietics, and maybe even then, hematopoietic system and the immune system are going to be important for whether you either get a disease or for helping you resolve it. So I think it's foundational for everything, personal bias. Um, do some microbiome work and how that affects the immune system. We also work on a variety of tumor models and kidney function, again, from a point of view of the immune system. And our tools are, we like to build really good mouse models of human disease as accurate as possible, and then use genetically modified mice to try to understand how certain cell types are responsible for either resolving or exacerbating disease. So that's bread and butter for us. Um, in addition, more recently, we started looking at things like high throughput technology, single cell sequencing, single cell proteomics in human samples. And the idea there is, you know, if you buy what I just said about every disease has an immune component, then really intervening, all you need to do is to figure out which of those cells are having a bad effect in the disease, that particular disease, and then try to target them for therapeutic benefits. So that's where we're going. I think that's where the field is going. 
And again, plug to UBC, we should be looking at trying to have those technologies at our fingertips for understanding disease. Okay, so what I want to tell you about today, a uh, quick introduction to innate lymphoid cells, cells that are very near and dear to our heart. I'll tell you about um, some old data that shows that they're absolutely critical for kicking off allergic disease. I'll show you some just summary data for that. Then I'll tell you about a role they play in a fibrotic disease. In this case, we're going to talk about Crohn's disease model. Um, and I'll show you that not innate cells type two, but innate cells type three are responsible for driving fibrosis, so relatively incurable disease in the gut, and how we think you could possibly target it by targeting those cells. Then if I have a little bit of time, I'll tell you about the origins of innate lymphoid cells, because that's been a bit murky, and how we're trying to develop some um, tools to look at fate mapping innate lymphoid cells. Come on. Very basic immunology, I don't want to bore you, but basically people have traditionally characterized immune response into three different buckets. Type one immune response, TH1 response, tends to be antiviral, anti-tumor, think COVID-19, and you've got a lot of that. Um, these tend to be driven by molecules like gamma interferon and TNF-alpha, really rapid inflammatory molecules. Um, resolved by macrophages, T cells, and NK cells, fighting intracellular pathogens. A variety of immunoglobulins help with that, so does IgA. And again, antiviral, anti-tumor responses. Completely different responses, Th2 responses. This is the immune response you develop by parasites. Um, also the one that's pathological when you start getting allergies and diseases like that. And these are the cells that really make you feel like hell when you get allergies. They're driven by these cytokines, kind of the small cytokine numbers, IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. Um, tend to be driven by B cells, eosinophils, and mast cells. These are innate cells that help you fight uh, parasites, but also make you feel bad with allergies. They're antibody-driven responses, and they also tend to be the responses you develop when you're undergoing tissue repair. So once you get damage from a parasite, you need to then fix that damage. And that's what these Th2 immune responses help you do. Oh my God, I've got a dialogue going up there. It's great. <laughs> Th17 responses. Um, these are for uh, things like salmonella bacterial infections. That's the good response. The bad response when that goes bad is things like multiple sclerosis and autoimmune disease, psoriasis, other chronic inflammatory anti self diseases. Um, these are mediated by the higher number cytokines, IL-17, 21, and 22, tend to be driven by neutrophils and Th17 cells, different antibody isotype, and their inflammatory responses. Okay, so, your computer doesn't move, come on you. You've got a sticky keyboard on them. There we go. Okay, so all of those responses are driven by subclasses of T cells. Those are shown here. Each of them has a different master transcription factor that regulates their development. That's shown on the right here. Here are the cytokines we just talked about. These cells each recognize specific antigen and infected cells via T cell receptor. Very exquisitely antigen specific and they're very important cells. But what's been a mystery for a really long time is how do you know to make the right immune response the first time you see a pathogen or the first time you see a parasite, first time you get an allergy? Why do you get a Th2 response and not a Th1 response to that allergen? What causes that? And the answer is that recently, and this is within the past 10 to 15 years, we've discovered a whole new subset of lymphocytes called innate lymphoid cells. And for every T cell subtype you have, you also have an innate lymphoid cell subset. These tend to be tissue resident cells. They make exactly the same uh, cytokine molecules that the T cells make. They even are dependent on the same transcription factors. And the one big difference is they don't have a T cell receptor. So they're not antigen specific, but they reside in the tissues and they help make sure that you make the right response the first time you see a, a, a pathogen. Okay, now 
One transcription factor that's really unique to these ILC2s is a transcription factor called ROR alpha. It's absolutely essential for the development. And ROR alpha um, is an orphan steroid type transcription factor. It sits on DNA and has a ligand binding domain. Um, luckily for us, when we first found these ILC2s and realized they expressed high levels of this transcription factor, is the fact that there was a naturally occurring mouse mutant called the staggerer mice. So this is from Jack's labs years ago. It's a spontaneous deletion of the ligand binding domain. So these uh, mice have this factor, but it can't bind ligand, and so it's always turned off. These mice have a, a number of neurological defects, but what's interesting is if you look at the hematopoietic cells, the one thing they're missing is ILC2s. So years ago, we thought this is a great model for looking at ILC2 function. We simply take these bone marrow from these mice and transplant it into an irradiated recipient. So now we make a chimera that takes care of the neurological defects and you're left with a mouse that just lacks ILC2s and now you can study their function. And that's what we've been doing ever since. So to summarize a lot of work that we've done on allergic disease, this is a typical allergic response. So normally, you inhale an allergen, and most allergens are proteases, and they do damage to your epithelia. So you get a damaged epithelia. That instantly releases molecules called alarmins. These are just inflammatory agents. They're pre-stored in some epithelia. And actually, they're made in a huge way by mesenchymal stem cells just underneath the epithelium. And that's probably the biggest source of these, cyto of these cytokines. Anyway, as soon as you see damage, these get released. They activate ILC2s, which are just underneath the epithelia as well. These cells then start making huge amounts of these Th2 cytokines, IL-5, which recruits eosinophils long before you get an antigen-specific response. IL-13, which activates local myeloid cells. These cells grab antigen, they move to the draining lymph node, and now they start presenting to naive T cells, and now you start developing an antigen-specific Th2 response. These cells then leave the lymph node, they circulate back through the circulation, re-enter the tissue, and now you get antigen-specific responses to whatever you're allergic to, cats, a pain, uh, ragweed, things like that. Um, they also now activate the second arm of the immune response, the B cells, to start making IgG and Ig1. You start getting mucus production. You start getting airway hyperresponsiveness. And these are all the things that make you feel really bad when you get allergic disease. Now, what we showed years ago is that if you knock out the ILC2s in the, RAG2, in the ROR alpha mice, none of this happens. You don't recruit any eosinophils. You don't get these cells moving to the lymph node and presenting antigen. You don't get an antigen-specific T cell response. And in fact, you don't make any IgG or IgE to those allergens. So effectively, you've blocked allergic disease. What we also showed is that is strictly dependent on these cells being in this tissue. So if you deliver antigen systemically, if you inject a pain systemically, or you put an allergen in the, in the blood, now you no longer need these cells, and you can prime an immune response through the T cells because the antigen just gets swept to the lymph node. You don't need these cells anymore. So they're not completely redundant with T cells. What you need them for is that local first inflammatory insult. OK, so these guys are great. They drive Th2 immune responses. Th2 responses are the ones that actually do a lot of pathology when you get chronic disease. So when you get fibrosis, when your kidneys start to give out and get old, when your liver gets damaged from drinking too much, and you get matrix deposition in your liver, that's fibrotic disease. That's an overactive healer response. So we wanted to see if these ILC2s are responsible for driving that too. And the model we chose was a gut fibrosis model. So what we do is we take mice, we treat them with streptomycin to clear some of the bacteria out of the gut, make a, create a niche. And then we infect them with a very mild form of salmonella. So this is an attenuated vaccine grade of salmonella. That infects the gut. The mice clear it, no problem. But what happens is they start to generate an inflammatory response. And while they're clearing, you start to get deposition of fibrotic matrix in the gut. 
and it's through all of the muscle layers and the epithelial layers in the gut. And it looks for all the world like Crohn's disease. This is a disease that some kids get. It's pathological. You get fibrosis of the gut. The only treatment for that disease is to cut a section of the gut out and re-ligate it back together and hope that it, it goes away. There's really no great treatment for Crohn's disease. Um, so we wanted to see if maybe these innate lymphoid cells are driving that and we could possibly target them for therapy. Oh, right. This is what that model looks like. So here's a normal gut. You can see the lumen here with the poo in the center. And here's the epithelial on the outside. So a close up. Here's what happens if you give that um, low grade salmonella infection. You get a massive deposition of matrix throughout all layers of the gut. Here's uh, the matrix stained in blue. This is a, a, a trichome strain. So we asked, what happens if you do that same type of model with the rural alpha knockout mice? So here's wild type mice. You give them the salmonella infection, they start getting a bit of inflammation, start depositing matrix below the epithelia. Gets much worse by day 21. By day 35, you've got what looks a lot like Crohn's disease. If you look at the rural alpha knockouts, they're protected. So you get a little bit of the inflammation and a little matrix deposition, but it's night and day when you compare them to these guys. So it looks like getting rid of or alpha protects you against Crohn's-like fibrosis. Uh, this just shows you it in color. Here's we've stained for collagen in red. And you can see you get a bit of matrix deposition, but again, nothing like what you see with the wild type mice. So they're protected. Less production of this pathological type of collagen, less TGF beta in the gut. Okay. So we're geniuses. We figured out ILC2s are responsible for fibrosis, and now we can target them to cure it. Something that kind of threw us for a loop. So here I'm showing you IL-5 levels and IL-13 levels in those mice. And yeah, you knock out Roar Alpha, you have less IL-5 and less IL-13, those cytokines that are responsible for TH2 responses. But here are the uninfected mice. So when you infect, you actually have less of those cytokines than you do in an uninfected mouse. So that really threw us for a loop and didn't fit with our model at all. So we said, okay, well, wait a minute. Let's, maybe we just missed the peak of cytokine production. Let's take a look at some other knockouts. So here I'm, look, I'm showing you data from a mouse where we've knocked out all eosinophils. Eosinophils are really big drivers of Th2 immune response. If we get rid of eosinophils, maybe we'll get rid of the disease. Not at all. Without eosinophils, the disease actually is almost worse. So if you take out one big arm of Th2 immunity, no effect. STAT6 is a transcription factor downstream from all T cell signaling and Th2 cells. IL-13 receptor signaling, IL-4 receptor signaling. You knock that one out and the mice get exactly the same degree of inflammation. So knocking out all of the Th2 immune responses, you don't see a change. So what's going on? Well, we went back and looked at more cytokines. So here's IL-6 in wild type mice. Here are the rural alpha knockouts. That's lower. Okay, that's interesting. TNF is a little bit lower, but what's really low is IL-22 and IL-17. These are Th17 cytokines, completely different from the Th2. And that got us going back to the literature. So it turns out that you have two transcription factors. There's one called ROR alpha, which I've told you about already. There's a second one called ROR gamma. And many people consider this to be a redundant transcription factor. If you knock out ROR alpha, you lose all ILC2s. But it's also expressed in these cell types. These cells are present, but nobody could ever look to see if they're functional when you get rid of ROR alpha in them. So we had a look at that. So here's TH ILC3s looking at IL-17 production. Wild type, plenty. Roar alpha knockouts. The ILC3s are there, but they're not making IL-17. Here's IL-22. It's a little bit less. Not as huge, but it's, it's lower. And here are TH17 cells. These are bona fide T cells. They also don't make IL-17 when you knock out raw alpha. So the bottom line is those cells are there, but knocking out this transcription factor has made them non-functional. 
Okay, so if you believe that, and if IL-17 is really driving the disease, what happens if we start injecting these mice with antibodies against that cytokine? Will that help the disease? So here we've got mice that were injected with a isotype control antibody. These are wild type mice that were injected with an IL anti-IL-17 antibody. And you can see we're losing most of that fibrotic matrix deposition. So treating with an anti-IL-17, we can prevent that Crohn's-like fibrosis. What about IL-22? Showed you that was a little bit lower. Well, if you treat with an anti-IL-22 antibody, it gets really bad. You don't want to do that. You find that the fibrotic matrix deposition actually gets a lot worse. So it looks like if you had a patient with Crohn's disease and you gave them an antibody to IL-17, and they maybe even provided them with a little supplemental IL-22, you could probably cure the disease. So that's what we think is a, is a good next strategy. Okay, so I've shown you those cells look a little different. Here we've purified different batches of those ILC3s to ask what else is different in those cells when you knock out Rho alpha. And I don't wanna bore you with too many of the details, but if you look, here's IL-17 receptor, here's IL-23 receptor, there's a bunch of chemokine receptors in here too. In each case, you find that they, these cells have lost or down-regulated expression of those inflammatory signaling receptors. So the reason they're probably not signaling well is because they don't have the receptors to recognize that they're in an inflamed environment. It's a little bit like being drunk and trying to walk home when you don't know you're drunk. You just can't find your way around, you know? You don't have anything to tell you you're drunk, and so you just can't find your way home. So they're just not doing their job. Okay, is it that they're not doing their job or is there also a bit of a fate switch in these mice? So here's something interesting too. Here we've purified all of the innate lymphoid cells and K cells from the gut. Um, in pink, you're seeing the wild type cells. In blue, you're seeing the knockout cells. If you calculate the number of different innate lymphoid cell subsets in this gut, you find that first, you see an increase in NK cells. So ILCs, three, ILCs are on one branch, NK cells are on another branch. We're seeing a loss of a lot of the innate lymphoid cells, all of the ILC2s, a little bit of loss of some of the ILC3s, but a big increase in the natural killer cells. So it looks like we may be switching the fate from ILC towards NK in these mice. And I point that out because there are some folks who have been looking at innate lymphoid cells as responder cells to tumors using these raw alpha knockout mice. And I think you've got to be very, very careful about how you interpret that data. If you lose the ILCs, but instead you start boosting NK cells, I can think of a lot of reasons why that would help with the cancer model and have nothing to do with ILC2s or ILC3s. So if you read those papers, read them with a grain of salt. Okay, um, so the summary of this part of the talk. I've shown you that in a salmonella-driven model of fibrosis, and remember, fibrosis is a disease that all of us are gonna get as we get old. One, all of you are gonna die at some stage, I hate to say it, from a disease where you probably have an organ that fails because it's gotten old and gotten fibrotic. I've shown you that at least in the gut model, Rora alpha and ILC3s are responsible for driving fibrosis. And if you could block Rora alpha, and remember, it's a steroid hormone type transcription factor. If you could block it, you might be able to ameliorate some fibrotic disease. I've shown you it's dependent on TH17 cells and ILC3s. IL-17 appears to be the real driver in this case. Um, I haven't shown you this data, but we can prove that it's actually the ILC3s and not the T cells that are driving the disease through some complicated genetics. And inhibiting Rora alpha might be a good therapeutic strategy for um, fibrosis. Okay, what about other fibrotic diseases? Are all of them the same or are there differences and do some ILCs help with one and hurt with the other? So we're looking at kidney disease now, we're looking at dystrophies. Interested in dystrophies because actually most people don't realize it, but when you get muscular dystrophy and these kids die in their early 20s or late teens, it's because of, of fibrosis. The muscles tend to degenerate because they get injured every time you walk. Every time you go to the gym, your muscles get injured and you rebuild them. In kids with dystrophies, the injury is much more severe. It happens all the time as they move, and the repair can't keep up with the damage. So we were thinking maybe ILCs drive 
repair in this non-barrier organ too. So we had a look at that. And here I'm showing you wild type um, muscular dis dystrophy mice, so these dystrophic mice, MDX mice. These are mice that will get dystrophy with age. This is looking in the, um, in the uh, diaphragm muscle, sorry about that. And what you see in pink is muscle fibers sectioned on end. And what you see in blue is matrix deposition. So these are wild type MDX mice. You can see they're starting to get matrix deposited in their diaphragms. Here are the raw, raw alpha knockouts. And we're actually seeing fewer muscle fibers and a lot more matrix. So it looks like in this model, knocking out raw alpha is not protective, it's pathological. Um, same thing is true in the tibia muscle. Tibia looks okay in this dystrophic mouse, as good as it can ever look. When you knock out raw alpha, that fibrotic matrix deposition gets worse. What happens if we knock, knock out STAT6? That again, TH2 transcription factor, again, it gets worse. So in this particular model, and this comes back to what I was saying about understanding the cell types involved in various different tissues. It looks like ILC2s and TH2 immunity is important for repairing damage. And if you get rid of it, the pathology gets worse. Okay, so that's interesting for a couple of reasons. Oops. So it's very difficult to protect yourself from getting allergies. And so that's a problem, but we know how to induce allergies, that's easy. And if you think about it, if you're a kid who's gonna die of fibrotic disease in their early 20s, maybe you'd trade being a little bit allergic if you knew it was gonna help you repair your muscles and prevent you from getting damaged. So we're trying to chase that down. Um, so I've shown you that um, we can skew mice towards being more allergic just by treating them with antibiotics or giving them allergens. Would this help? So we're starting to look at that. I'm just gonna tell you right now it's complicated and it seems like it's gonna depend on when you start inducing a TH2 inflammation, how early you do it and how persistently you keep it going. Okay, so coming to that complication. ILCs are a really interesting cell type, but they're a newly discovered cell type and there are a lot of questions about how they are generated. Are they plastic? Can you go from being an ILC1 to an ILC2 if you put a cell type in the right inflammatory environment? That's starting to creep into the literature. Um, they tend to be long-lived cells. So are they generated from tissue resident progenitors or do they always come from the bone marrow? That's still a bit of a black box. Um, are there peripheral populations of ILCs that move around? Do cells come from the lung and now move to the gut and vice versa? There's some evidence for that in the literature. Are all of them produced in the bone marrow or do they come early in life and then be tissue resident thereafter? All of these questions are getting to make this field really murky. And so we're starting to try to build better tools for doing, answering those questions, which is what I'm gonna have Ahmed, I think, tell you about now. All right, can everyone hear me fine? I'm very excited to present some of the work I've been doing on the emerging population of innate lymphoid cells uh, that are hardwired to make your stereotypical immune programs that Kelly talked about in his introduction. Uh, you'll probably find one of your favorite cytokines produced by ILCs. But one of the main questions I get asked very frequently is uh, why do we have them and what's their function since T cells make very similar cytokines and immune functions. But I think to keep it simple, uh, this paper showed very nicely in the context of ILC1s, but I think the same applies for all ILCs. Uh, in the, when you have inflammation or infection, ILCs respond very rapidly. And then that way they can prevent the inflammation from escalating before your T cells have time to get instructed and recruited. 
So you can visualize these cells by uh, flow cytometry. So these cells are characterized as a lineage negative population. So they're non T cell, non B cell, non myeloid cells, and they constitutively express the IL-7 receptor, so CD127. And if you look at the transcription factors they express, uh, you see that most of the ILCs in the gut, they're ROR gamma T positive. So those are the ILC3s that Kelly talked about. And you see if you get on the ROR gamma T negative population, you see a GATA3 positive population, which is your ILC2s. These ILC2s, they express the inhibitory receptor, KLRG1. Uh, oh, perfect. Where is it? I would love that. Oh, thank you. So yeah, uh, like I mentioned, if you look at those ILC2s, they express KLRG1, which is an inhibitory receptor that is in the T cell field, a uh, marker of terminal differentiation. Uh, they lack the expression of NKP46 and CCR6, which is expressed by some ILC3s. And if you look at different tissues, this is where it gets interesting, uh, they segregate based on the tissue type they come from. So they're all ILC2s. But based on the tissue, they segregate uh, because they have different uh, tissue-specific phenotypes. So in the gut, the majority of these cells highly express IL-17RB. This is the IL-25 receptor. And this is a steady state. And if you look in the inflamed cecum, uh, when you do single cell sequencing, so here's your NK cells, you have your IL-C3s, this purple cluster is the IL-C2s, and you have your IL-C1s, the IL-C2s highly expressed the IL-17 RB and it's not expressed in any of the other lineages. So now you can think that we can fate map and track these cells. Uh, if you generate a mouse, uh, that is the IL-17 RB, GFP, CRE-RT2 mouse. So basically using the promoter for IL-17 RB, we uh, have a CRE-RT2 linked with as well as a GFP protein. So all the cells that express the IL-17 RB will be labeled with GFP. So you can now track your LC2s. And it works quite beautifully. So if you look in the wild type, you see no lineage negative GFP positive population, no LC2s, uh, because we can't, there's no GFP. This is just the wild type. And if you look in the transgenic now, you can clearly see we can track those LC2s. You see a lineage negative GFP positive population. And this is in the small intestine. And you can test the function of this CRE by using reporter mice. So using the ROSA stop RFP mice crossed with a CRE transgenic. Uh, when you give, the, give these mice tamoxifen, you can drop out the stop cassette and you will indelibly mark those cells with RFP. And uh, so this is a transgenic mouse with no tamoxifen. You have this GFP with no RFP showing up. Uh, so it's not, a, you can't, you haven't dropped the stop cassette yet. But when you give these mice tamoxifen, now RFP lights up like gangbusters. You just see it light up, and it's night and day difference with high efficiency. And in terms of specificity, this IL-17 uh, this RB is not expressed in any of the other lineages. So when you look at your CD8s, your CD4s, and your gamma deltas, uh, it's not expressed, and you don't see any GFP or RFP signal in any of the mice. So this is just... Uh, the, the GFP mice with no tamoxifen. This is when it's given tamoxifen. Either case, sh lo long story short, you don't see any signal. And uh, this is using the RFP stop model, which is very sensitive at looking at a uh, small number of cells that have indiscriminate type of expression at the transgene. So it's quite remarkable that it's, uh, we don't see that in any of the lineages. And the gut is special. Uh, ILCs in the gut, they span several transcriptional states. So because of this, and it's also a fast turnover organ, so keep that in mind, uh, I was quite interested in looking at the question of regarding the stability of ILC phenotypes, their heterogeneity, and also their function. And these mice can definitely do that. So if you look at a mouse with no tamoxifen, you don't get any lineage negative RFP signal. Uh, and if you look at the tamoxifen, now it lights up like I, uh, we would expect, but this is where it gets interesting. So if you look actually at the phenotype of these cells, the majority of them that used to express IL-17RB, so this lineage negative RFP positive cells are IL-C2s that expressed the IL, that used to express IL-17RB in a previous life, 
But for some reason, they kind of downregulated all 17 RB, and the majority of them no longer express it. You still have some that express all 17 RB, uh, but a big proportion of them now no longer expresses, and this can be seen here in the bar chart. And in the terms of their phenotype, uh, these cells don't express your NKP4E6 or CCR6 or NK1.1. So all the markers I showed you in the earlier slide, these cells lack, these double negative cells that used to express IL-17 lack those markers. So it's quite interesting that we see this instability in IL-17 RB expression. So long story short, these ilc 2 that express the IL-17 RB in a previous life, many of them continue to express IL-17 RB but a big fraction of these cells lost expression of this uh, gene. So now to better understand these cells, we're trying to dissect the role of our alpha again in rc 2 s because we, Kelly showed you beautifully that for alpha is a critical regulator of rc 2 differentiation. And if I actually look at in terms of the single cell seq data, uh, ROR alpha is expressed in all the ILCs, uh, not in K cells, uh, but now we're, we can actually test whether or alpha, what happens when we delete or alpha in a temporal manner, because this is a tamoxifen dependent creep. So we take our alpha flux mouse, we cross it with a discrete transgenic al 17 rb and now we have an inducible mouse to delete or alpha and LC2s. So I won't show you all the data because it gets, uh, <laughs> gets very messy and very interesting, uh, but basically this is a wild type. Uh, you, this is like I showed you before, lineage negative, RFP, uh, GFP, and you can still fate map. If you look at a row alpha knockout, what you would expect is that you would have lost this population, but you can still detect a lineage negative GFP positive population, even in the knockout when you administer tamoxifen. And you can do the same kind of analysis with the fate mapping that I showed you earlier. So this is really interesting. And what's quite intriguing is that we also see an immune skewing in these mice. So these mice have more CD4s in the knockout, uh, more CD8s and more gamma deltas in terms of the frequency uh, relative to the wild type. So it seems that the deletion of ROR alpha in the adult mouse, when you give them tamoxifen, for some reason, you see an immune skewing that we're still trying to investigate in terms of uh, disease and tissue homeostasis. And uh, to better understand it, I'm just going to dive a little bit back into the single cell seq data I've been playing around with. Uh, this is the wild type. When you knock out or alpha, as you'd expect, you lose ILC2s. So this is the purple cluster. But you also lose a bit of ILC3s and a little bit of ILC1. But what's night and day clear, as Kelly mentioned, is this increase in the NK cluster, as you can see in the heat map. So this suggests that the deletion of uh, or alpha ubiquitously, so this is just a global deletion. Uh, this may allow us to generate more NK cells, and I've been playing around with seeing if they uh, have an effect in some tumor models, uh, and we're still investigating that. I'll, uh, I'll just mention one more thing, which is, uh, might be of interest. We're looking at it from the LC3 side of things, because everything I showed you now has been LC2 oriented, but I'm also interested whether uh, these phenotypic instability and switches are mediated by LC3s in any way. So we take our alpha flux mouse, we can actually cross this with an RORC CRE mouse. So RORC encodes ROR gamma T, so all the cells that express LC3s. Uh, this is just a reporter mouse. Uh, you can see LC, different subset of LC3s express ROR gamma T, uh, but LC2s don't. So basically now you generate a alpha deficient LC3 mouse. When I first got this mouse, I was interested in looking in the lungs, just because in the lungs we know that there are if you look at the lineage negative, they're defined as thi one pi, and you look in the lungs, you see barely any LC3s. There is no ROR gamma T positive LC3s, basically. The majority of the lung is LC2s. So I was curious what happens in this, in the uh, alpha deficient LC3s. Uh, so when I looked in the, in the lungs, what was quite interesting is look, doing the same kind of gating analysis, you see a big increase in LC3s, uh, relative to the wild type. So this kind of blew my mind initially that why do we have more LC3s that are dysfunctional in the knockout compared to the wild type? And you can kind of now, Kelly mentioned how different immune cells have different roles in different diseases. We can, we're looking at how these cells are playing in these uh, in tissue homeostasis and disease. 
I uh, maybe a bit too fast because uh, I was worried about time. I had to cut a lot, a lot of, a lot of uh, data. But uh, for now, I'll just give some acknowledgments. So I'd like to thank a very talented postdoc, uh, Julianne. She's uh, been instrumental in a lot of the work I've been doing. Uh, Kristen has also been helpful in uh, my early days in the lab. Uh, of course, Mike for helping uh, with the mice and Kelly for all of his support and mentorship. Uh, so thank you. Yeah. Yes, I have a question and not, not be very well formulated because I'm only just beginning to learn about ILCs, but um, I was wondering with how you found the population that like uniquely expresses IL-17, does that happen when the ILC enters into the tissue? And like theoretically, if an ILC from the long left and ended up in the gut, would it then get IL-17 receptor as well? I don't even know if that's possible, so. We can pack you. It would depend on whether, yeah, you, you're trying to induce the tissue specific, an antigen specific inflammatory response or just a broad spectrum response. And I, I agree with you. We, we don't know whether that's going to be pathological if you push it too hard. Um, and, and, and the other side of that is that um, you, you have ILC2s to help repair some damage, but if that continues to repair, and continues to push, then it becomes pathological. And that's when you get fibrotic matrix deposition there, and you might be pushing them too hard. So it's kind of a Goldilocks thing. You know, people have been asking for years, um, why do you prepare for responses? 
think that's true of the Crohn's disease too. It's funny, people people tried some Crohn's disease trials by an anti IL seventeen before we actually did that work, and that was a criticism. We got one of our papers, and then they looked at the the, the clinical trials that had been done. They'd been done on mild Crohn's patients where they had inflammation but no matrix deposition. And in fact, they treated every patient who had fibrosis because they didn't, they wanted to make sure their trial worked. And I think they actually excluded the patients who would have benefited most from the FIL 17 therapy in the trial. So that they just did. Is from neonatal development and early, early uh, biology. The, the, the hottest thing in this field these days for all hematopoiesis is tissue resident cells. And what we're starting to see with the ILCs is that they come in waves right after birth, they colonize tissues and then they stay there for the rest of your life. And it's really unless you have a catastrophe that you start making more of them in the bone marrow to come and reseed the organs. So I think. What happens to you early in life probably determines a lot of what happens to you the rest of your life. 